Good evening, welcome to TDM Talk Show. Our guest tonight is Reverend Stephen Morgan, the new Dean of the Faculty of Religious Studies at the University of St. Joseph. Originally from Wales, Dr. Morgan comes to Macau from his role as the economist of the Diocese of Portsmouth in England. While not his first trip to Asia, the Reverend's time here comes at an interesting and pivotal period for relations between the mainland and the church. Welcome, Reverend. Thank you for joining us. Not at all. Well, we are in definitely interesting times now. There are a lot of changes happening, not only on a global scale, but also in terms of the church and its relations with the mainland. Yeah. Um, obviously, there there has been a relationship before, but it seems like this might be moving forward, in particular from September when there was a provisional agreement on the appointment of bishops. Um, the Secretary of the State of the Vatican said the agreement is of great importance, especially for the life of the church in China. Do you think that that will have any change in how Catholics currently in China practice their faith? Well, I think the first thing I should say is that I've only been here six weeks, and okay. it's nearly a quarter of a century since I spent uh, any time out here. Um, and so uh, I think one ought to be, uh, well, I ought to be a little bit circumspect about that. It's clearly a momentous thing. Um, and uh, two huge uh, organizations that are both accustomed to taking the long view, mm -hmm. that is the government of China and um, the Holy See, would not have entered into this agreement without both sides thinking there was something to be gained from it. It's very clear that the Holy See sees China as uh, a very important place for, for it to regularize its relationships. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with 12 million Catholics or so in China, 1.4 billion people or whatever the number is, um, China is obviously uh, an important place. Whether it changes the way in which Catholics live on a day-to-day -day basis in mainland China remains to be seen, I think. And in regards to the, appointing, uh, the appointment of the bishops themselves, uh, there has been spe speculation as to whether there will also be, let's say, a, a veto power mm -hmm. on the appointment of bishops and exactly how everything will work out in terms of the machinations of it. Um, is this a step forward, sideways? Well, I think it's a fool who's prepared to comment on an agreement that he hasn't seen. And for, I think, perfectly understandable reasons, this agreement has been kept very largely um, under wraps. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so that both the People's, uh, the People's Republic of China government and the Holy See can simply work out how it works. Uh, but it isn't unusual for the church to have, at least not historically, for the church to have arrangements with governments relating to the nomination of bishops and the, and the pope retaining a power of veto. That's historically something that's very common. Uh, in Europe, it was the norm until about 1900. Um, and it still remains in, in a number of places. For example, in uh, the French region of Alsace-Lorraine, um, it's the president of France who nominates the bishop. Um, in Switzerland, there are a number of cantons in which uh, the local church or uh, the local government elects bishops that are then confirmed by uh, the pope. Now, it's been the case that for the last 55 years or so, the church has tried to move away from that. Well, in fact, longer than that. But at a, a huge council in Rome of two and a half thousand bishops in the 1960s, a decision was taken that we try to move away from that. Um, but those are, uh, th that, that was a, a decision taken with very particular things in mind. And uh, the Holy See has clearly taken a view that it is worth setting on one side, at least for the moment, uh, reservations around the involvement of governments in the appointment of bishops for perhaps the, the bigger goal of ensuring that uh, Catholics in China can function um, in a more uh, normal manner. Mm -hmm. Because there was the division, I mean, in 19, since 1957, there's yeah. been the China Catholic Patriotic Association, yeah. and then there were the underground churches. Yes. But by having, by having, let's say, more of a normalization of the status and, and of the understanding, um, do you think that that's going to lead to more people pursuing faith, in particular? Well, I think that must be the hope of the Holy See. Um, it would be the hope, I think, of, of any Catholic that um, the good news of Jesus Christ 
can be spread through the work of his church. Um, so I suppose on a uh, on a principle level, that would be the that would be the hope. Whether that happens in the short term, I don't know. As I said earlier, both the uh, the People's Government and the Holy See are uh, accustomed to thinking in very, very long terms. Yes. Um, it's uh, it, it's uh, looking for easy wins in a 12, 18 month horizon is something that comes perhaps from the, the world of business and the world of uh, electoral cycles in politics. Neither the People's Republic of China government nor the Holy See have that as a primary concern. So I would think that there must be a hope that, that, that it would allow Catholicism to, uh, to thrive in China. Uh, and um, we hope and pray that that's the case. Now, currently within the mainland, there are five religions which are widely accepted. Yes. Um, despite the country in and of itself being, let's say, less religiously inclined. Um, those include Catholicism, Buddhism, Taoism, Protestant, Protestantism, and Islam. Yeah. Um, is this a way of showing any type of favorable treatment towards one of those five? Are they all treated equally within? I, I don't know whether they're treated equally, uh, and I don't think it's about favoritism. I think it's about uh, wanting to ensure that both the church and the state understand the parameters mm -hmm. within which they want to operate. Now, Catholicism in some respect is easier to deal with than Islam or Protestantism because of uh, an assumption, we would call it, um, we'd call it about the divine, the divine constitution of the church, that, that there is a unity uh, and that that unity is expressed through our ecclesial, that is our church communion with the mm. Pope. And so in some respects, we've got a kind of unified line of command, which is perhaps not there in those other religions. So in some respects, it makes it perhaps a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier for um, people to get their heads around. But remember, China's had a guarantee of religious liberty in its constitution for 20 years, mm -hmm. longer than that, 30 years now. Um, I think that's right. It may only be 20 years. Um, I think of the early 90s or the late 80s. Um, uh, and so it's quite natural in a country with so many people expressing different faiths for the government to want to understand the parameters uh, that religious organizations operate under. Uh, understand, but would that also say, could that also be expanded to set the parameters? Well, I think the state always, uh, and it, this is not uh, something that's um, uh, confined to uh, the government of the People's Republic of China, mm -hmm. uh, governments always want to be involved in setting the parameters. Um, it, it's in the political DNA. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, so long as uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience uh, can be accommodated within that, there's no particular reason to say that the state doesn't have the right to be involved in setting some of those rules. Okay. Uh, does that also mean that we're going to see a visit of the Pope to the mainland anytime soon? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the news in the last couple of days has been full of the fact that he, uh, that, that uh, uh, it's desired, at least by the government of North Korea, that he might go to North Korea. Um, I, I, do, I don't know. I seem, I seem to remember that uh, Pope Paul VI went to the Korean Peninsula, but I might be mistaken. He certainly went to the Philippines. I, I don't know. The Pope is an old man. Um, I suspect he thinks uh, very hard about his travel schedule. And in regards to, in terms of recognition and in terms of, obviously, one thing, one of the phrases that we hear very commonly here is one country, yes. one country, two systems, yes. primarily focus on one country. In regards to Taiwan, that is another aspect of the church's relationship with the mainland because the Vatican does, it's the only European state to maintain full diplomatic ties with the yep. country, with yep. the country of Taiwan, defined yep. as the country. Yeah. Does that mean that the Pope will visit Taiwan? Does that put, I mean, that obviously puts pressure on the mainland Vatican relationship. T Taiwan has always been a, a, a difficult issue. It's in some respects perhaps uh, evidence that the church moves very slowly and thinks in centuries that um, the reason that the Catholic Church recognizes um, Taiwan is that it recognized Taiwan uh, at a time when lots of people recognized Taiwan. Um, 
and it hasn't yet accommodated itself to the change that the United Nations uh, uh, made in 1971. Uh, 1971 um, seems like quite a long time even to me. Um, it must seem prehistoric to you. Um, but in Vatican terms, it's not very long. Mm -hmm. we, we should remember that Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict both made it perfectly clear that they would be prepared to shift their recognition to the People's Republic of China as and when the conditions were right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether... Uh, this is a step in that direction or not. I think it would be foolish uh, to, to speculate. Um, but clearly, um, when I was in Hong Kong in the, in the mid-90s, nobody really knew what one country, two systems meant. Um, 20 years on, we see it having worked very well in Hong Kong and very well in Macau. Um, I suspect there may be a, a hope that um, by demonstrating that the notion of one country, two systems can work, that the government of China can see, again, thinking in centuries, perhaps some kind of regularization of the status of Taiwan as well. And if the Vatican is part of that process, I, I imagine uh, that would suit the government of China very well. In, you mentioned Hong Kong, and, and you were in Hong Kong from 91 to 95. Mm, yeah. um, did you, do you see any kind of change within the, the religious uh, landscape of Hong Kong in between then and now? Well, I haven't seen much of Hong Kong since I've been back this time um, uh, because I've been very busy here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I rather thought I might be whizzing back and forth rather more frequently, but I, I've, I've got quite a lot to do, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about that. Both places feel slightly different, mm -hmm. um, uh, but they don't feel so radically different that, uh, fr from how they felt a, a quarter of a century ago, uh, that one wouldn't be able to uh, say, yeah, that's what Hong Kong's like, that's what Macau's like. Um, the religious climate in Hong Kong has always been very distinct from its political climate, and I think um, We've watched from Europe, we've watched the political developments in, in Hong Kong with uh, a measure of, well, a measure of interest, of course, having been there for such a long time. Well, not such a long time, but some time, a long time ago. Have to make a mark. Well, yeah, OK. I was quite a lot younger, too, and it seemed longer <laughs> in those days. Um, uh, we've watched the politics um, with a measure of concern. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, um, the church because the church is grounded in any society it operates in, it's not immune from that. But I don't sense that the religious climate in Hong Kong has changed markedly, and I don't think the religious climate here has changed markedly. I mean, Macau uh, has a very long history of um, religious pluralism and religious freedom. Uh, the Catholic Church has been operating in Macau for 450 years. Uh, it's a significant part of the, uh, the culture, uh, the history, and the the life of, of the city, uh, the, the life of uh, the life of the territory, um, uh, and I, I I don't sense that that has changed radically. Which, but that's we are in both our SARs. They're still special administrative mm. regions. They have their own framework, currency, yes. yep. and political structure. Um, but we're seeing an increased pressure on the application of the mainland's, let's say, will within these SARs. That, does that not seem slightly at odds with, let's say, the opening up that the mainland is demonstrating in regards to this new treaty with the Vatican? Mm. It, it's not something I've sensed, actually, since I've been here. Um, I think if you'd asked me 20, 20 years ago uh, what extent the mainland would be seeking to exercise its influence in these SARs 20 years on, I would have anticipated it would be much greater than it is. Um, there is, uh, with the opening up of China, uh, and, and it, it's now, I'm trying to work out, it's now nearly 30 years since uh, China started to open up quite dramatically. There is bound to be a change in, in Chinese society, and we've seen that, and those societies around it are bound to be influenced by that, both in terms of China's political will uh, but also simply in terms of its economic weight yeah. uh, and its cultural influence. And uh, to think that 
somehow or other Macau or Hong Kong could be insulated from that, I think would be naive. Yeah, we, we are certainly feeling a certain type of, of change and, and let's say a progression in terms of how the relationship is established. In regards to the church's relationship um, with politics in and of itself, mm. we, we see leaders, certain leaders more than others, choosing to add um, a religious tone or references to God within mm. their, their political discourse. Um, and that could be for historical reasons, uh, it could be for populism reasons. Mm. Um, do you believe in the separation of church and state? Well, I'm British, of course, so I come from a country where we don't have the separation of church <laughs> and state. We have uh, an established church, uh, an established church that was formed in, uh, well, maybe rebellion's too strong a word, <laughs> um, but I'll use it anyway, rebellion against the Catholic Church. Um, I'm much less concerned about the particular political um, or constitutional arrangements around that kind of thing than I am about um, the expropriation of religious language to justify political uh, political um, agendas. Mm -hmm. now, there is a long history of that happening in some countries. Certainly some of the use of, uh, of religious themed language, for example, in American politics mm -hmm. is something that strikes a very strange note to a European ear and to a British ear particularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, other than the Queen in her Christmas message, uh, wishing everybody uh, a happy Christmas and praying God's blessing on them, it, it's, it's not a normal part of political discourse in Britain. And so when one hears American politicians or whatever stripe uh, try to co-opt uh, God uh, to their particular political agenda, it always sounds a little bit strange. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it, perhaps in some respects, uh, rather distasteful. Um, uh, I almost feel like saying, well, perhaps you know these arguments ought to stand on their own without the appeal to the authority of God to back them up. But different countries have different cultural expectations, and um, there is a long history of American, particularly American politicians, um, using language that is either explicitly or implicitly evangelical. Mm -hmm. The previous president of the United States, for example, very often uh, sounded like um, a revivalist preacher, uh, albeit with um, a lack of explicit references to God. Uh, there were implicit use of language, there was an implicit use of language that sounded very revivalist at mm -hmm. times. Americans seem to like that. Uh, it would go down like a lead balloon, as the expression is, <laughs> if British politicians did it, if, if Jeremy Corbyn, unlikely, or Theresa May, daughter of a vicar, started using religious language to justify their arguments, uh, I think they would see their, uh, their poll numbers crater pretty quickly, actually. It's interesting to see the division between uh, what is still the Western world, but then mm. the actual voting basis choosing to accept the use of, of religious um, discourse, let's yes. say, or, or yeah. the appropriation of religious uh, yes. words into those type of political statements. But there's still a division within the Western world. Oh, itself. I, I it's think I, I, I think all politics is local, and um, the particular histories of different countries have a very direct impact on that. President Macron um, made fairly moderate, moderate comments about the contribution of Catholicism, Christianity in general, and Catholicism to French culture earlier this year, and. Uh, frankly, the reaction from certain political uh, parts, uh, certain parts of the political establishment in France, you would have thought that he was um, suggesting that the Archbishop of Paris be the next president of France. Um, they were very moderate comments, but because of France's own particular political history since 1789, since the French Revolution, any suggestion from a French politician that the church might have a role in French society is highly sensitive. Now, that's not, uh, that wouldn't be the case in Italy, It'd be much less the case. Despite the fact that they're also going through a, a wave of, um, let's say, anti-Muslim sentiment, in yeah. particular within other countries which are surrounding them. Yes. So the, 
the political environment and the, the anti-religious, let's say, environment? With well, the, the I, th I think that's very largely about fear of the other. Yes. I think it's also about a fear of cultural change about which one hasn't been consulted, mm -hmm. um, running up against the reality of people being driven out of predominantly Muslim countries as a result of a whole series of things, but not excluding political interference from Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very, very difficult situation, which is why you hear the Holy Father constantly talking about the need to be welcoming to refugees. Whilst, at the other hand, um, good Catholics and good Christians in Europe being profoundly worried by um, an Islamification, as they sense in, 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 in some places, I think it's very largely over, uh, overstated. And it's not with, it, it doesn't go without comment that, for example, um, the European country with the lowest number, absolute, and pretty close, I think, to the lowest number uh, proportionally of Muslim immigrants is Hungary, which is the country that seems to be making most noise about the threat. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, it isn't to say that I, uh, I, I look at the uh, large-scale immigration into Europe from predominantly Muslim countries as being something that one ought to be entirely relaxed about. Um, uh, I, I think, I think uh, cultural change um, is something that is often very threatening to people and needs to be managed very, very carefully. But clearly the kind of populist reaction to it that says, you know, Hungary is a Christian country and uh, we don't want any Muslims here. Well, um, uh, you know, okay, that's a particular narrative. And I suppose if you've lived in Eastern Europe and your culture remembers the Turks uh, besieging Vienna and uh, that kind of thing, maybe that plays to a particular, a particular, um, a particular political uh, agenda. Mm. But I think it, it's very, very dangerous to demonize the other. Societies mm. that demonize the other very, very quickly become hostile, not just to the other, but in every respect. Mm -hmm. And I think that we see a bit of that going on. In going back to the church in, of, in and of itself, yep. um, it has been, it has gone through a series of, of different events which have not been positive for the church's image and which have not been good for many of the church's followers. Um, in, protect, in particular relating to the sexual abuse uh, crises and the church itself suffering a, a sort of or public divide mm. because of this and accusations being thrown back and forth saying whether Pope Francis knew about let's say the US um, the US Cardinal potential misconduct by the US yeah. Cardinal um, well I think it's admitted conduct yeah conduct, actually <laughs> it's um, at least by most people if not the Cardinal former Cardinal himself yes so this could cast doubt on the institution of the church itself um, how do you view how this is all impacting the, the layman? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't think it casts doubt on the institution of the church per se, mm -hmm. but it certainly um, calls into question the church's credibility. Um, the church holds uh, very high standards, at least speaks very high standards uh, around the whole issue of sexual morality. And then when significant individuals in the church betray that, and more importantly, when they damage the vulnerable, children, the people who are in a, otherwise vulnerable, people who are in positions of, for example, uh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom side of a power dynamic, mm -hmm. when people abuse those positions, um, that's bound to uh, call into question the credibility of the organization. Uh, if you if you hold yourself out as holding a set of values and then you live in a manner that is contrary to those values, people are entitled to point at you and say, well, as Jesus said to some of those who were criti critical to him, uh, hypocrite, uh, you're a whited sepulchre. You know, you look okay on the outside, but the inside is dead. Um, now, there's been a lot of that. There's been a lot of that in the whole of society. The church uh, grounded in society, as I said earlier, has suffered from it and has suffered from it grievously. We don't know uh, what the detail of um, the sanctions or otherwise in respect of Archbishop McCarrick were. We don't know 
what Pope Benedict knew. We don't know what Pope John Paul II knew. We don't know what Pope Francis knew. Uh, I, I hope and pray that we will, because it, it, I've been involved in uh, safeguarding within the Catholic Church in England and Wales for nearly 15 years. And one of the things that is uh, constant in the voices of victims has been they want clarity, they want transparency. They want, yes, they want apologies. Sometimes they want compensation, and quite rightly so. But what they want most of all is to know that this isn't going to happen to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And actually the only way that that's going to happen is if people are transparent, if they don't think first, how do I save the reputation of the organisation, yes. but in fact think, what is the right thing to do for the victims and the survivors of this kind of abuse? It doesn't matter who's committed that abuse, and the higher up the tree they, they are in the church, the instinct should simply be, to say, well, I don't care if you're a bishop, an archbishop, or a cardinal, you're subject to the same rules as everybody else. I was in the US doing business a great deal around 2002. In fact, I was in Boston when the, the story about cardinal law broke, and it was a very, very uncomfortable place to be. Uh, I was in a bar, uh, not far from the Cheers bar, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of conversation going on about it. And there was a chap at the bar who said, look, uh, people have always done bad things. Uh, I don't really mind that people do bad things. Okay. What I do mind is when people in authority cover up yeah. the people doing bad things. Mm -hmm. That's the real scandal. Now, is this, does that mean that it is something, as somebody who has been involved in safeguarding mm -hmm. and, and trying to internally fix the mm -hmm. problem, is it something that can be only fixed from the inside out? Uh, no, I don't, think that, I don't think it is something that can only be fixed from the inside out. I think, uh, I think state agencies are always... Uh, are always, and quite rightly, uh, interested, uh, but will always be playing catch-up unless the internal culture of an organisation changes. And there needs to be a culture in the church that simply doesn't tolerate this kind of behaviour. Uh, there has been uh, a long history of countries saying, oh, well, this is a problem in such and such a place, and it's not a problem here, mm -hmm. only to find out that it is a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, now, I I saw that happen in Europe. I've seen it happen in North America. Uh, I had parishioners in my previous parish in England who were from southern India, uh, from Kerala. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't think it was a problem in Kerala. Uh, three months ago, a bishop in Kerala was credibly uh, accused of uh, abusing a religious sister, and he's now been uh, compelled to stand down. He's facing criminal charges. Mm -hmm. It's a universal problem in human society. Uh, the church, as I've said twice, is part of human society, and therefore it's mm -hmm. not exempt from this kind it's of... It's a very large part. It's a very large part. One-fifth, maybe one-sixth of the world's population. And therefore, we're not going to be exempt from this kind of thing. The state is always going to be, be interested, uh, quite rightly, in trying to deal with these kinds of situations. But ultimately, the only thing that will cure the problem, cure the problem, make the problem manageable, mm -hmm. is if the church as an organization universally recognizes that it cannot allow this kind of thing to happen. And when this kind of thing does happen, it has to have sound instincts about how you deal with things like this. And transparency of process, as we know from uh, business, we know from politics, transparency of process is, is usually a guarantee that the powerful aren't able to exercise uh, unfair advantage over the weak. Mm -hmm. And I think for all the argument about what is at the heart of the sex abuse crisis, one thing is pretty much agreed uh, by anybody who's ever been involved in it, and that is that it involves a power dynamic as much as anything else. I mean, there are clearly, uh, clearly sexual ang angles to it, and, mm -hmm. and we can't get away from that. We can't get away from the fact that something between 85 and 90 percent of these uh, acts are uh, acts of male-on-male -male mm -hmm. sexual aggression. But I think most people would recognize that uh, at the very heart of it is a, is, a, is a power dynamic being played out with a particular appetite, a damaged appetite, sure, but a particular mm -hmm. appetite. And the way you deal with power dynamics and you ensure fairness and freedom in those situations, I think, is by clarity, by transparency. 
uh, and by a situation in which no one is above the law. Yes. Now, the, the church is visibly through this, through the series of, of incidences that, that have come out publicly so far, um, its reputation has seen damage, has mm. seen people stepping back from the firm belief that they might have had in the institution and of itself. That being said, um, even though coupled with technology and coupled with um, more distractions, there seems to be less of a focus, let's say within the past five decades, on people being more religiously minded. That being said, within, let's say, more of the Western, the Western world. But I believe that you yourself said something in regards to Asia that um, oh, yes, that it easier, was, to, easier be to be optimistic, optimistic about, about the, the church, church in Asia. Asia. In, in Europe particularly, we have 2,000 years of Christian heritage. To be fair, China's Christian heritage goes back at least 1,400 years. But we have 2,000 years of a culture that became first predominantly and then overwhelmingly Christian. Mm -hmm. And it isn't difficult to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. um, if you travel around, for example, Belgium or the Southern <laughs> Netherlands, you see churches everywhere. Mm -hmm. And yet last week, the Archbishop of Utrecht, Cardinal Eich, announced that uh, he was going to be disposing, demolishing 90% of the churches in Belgium uh, in his diocese. Uh, he'd be left, I think, with 27 or 28 in a diocese that had nearly 300 because people have stopped practicing the faith. And they've stopped practicing the faith because they've stopped believing the faith. Now, um, we don't have the time and I don't have the expertise to be able to talk about that. It, it, sensibly, it's just an observable fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it's easy in Europe to think of Christianity in retreat. It's less difficult to think of that where Christianity is a minority religion and yet expanding quite quickly. Uh, the students that I teach from uh, East Timor, from mm -hmm. Myanmar, from Vietnam, are uh, from churches that are young. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they're young in the sense that they haven't been founded very long, but they're young in terms of uh, the age of their people. They're full of uh, love of the Lord. Uh, they love the Lord perhaps more than they love the church. And maybe the problem in Europe is that we got to love the church rather more than we love the Lord. Okay. Um, well, when you encounter that, their joy uh, and their, um, their enthusiasm, when you encounter their ambition for, not for themselves, but for the message, the good news of Jesus Christ, that's something that makes one profoundly optimistic. And how many, how many students do you have currently within your faculty? We've got 60 students at the moment, um, mostly uh, religious, Dominicans actually, uh, that is members of the orders of preacher. Uh, but we have uh, an increasing number of lay students in the faculty and we have the students from the new seminary the, the, uh, that uh, Bishop Lee established. Um, and there are, they're a great bunch of uh, they're a great bunch of people actually, um, and uh, they make me uh, both um, optimistic uh, and deeply depressed about being so old. <laughs> well, in in all kinds of respects, and many of them are younger even than my own children, um, uh, and so I'm very conscious of that of that age difference. Uh, I'm also conscious of the of the quality and the dedication of the members of the faculty. Uh, who are um, people who could have chosen much easier paths to, uh, f for their academic careers um, and are committed to we teach in English uh, and teaching in English to people whose first language is not English and not even an Indo-European language and maybe their second and third language is not Indo-European languages is a real, a real challenge. We find ourselves, one of my colleagues teaches Latin, Greek, and Hebrew to people who um, 18 months before they arrived in our faculty had little or no English. And, and they, those are easy, easy subject matter. Oh, ever so, uh, easy languages. <laughs> well, actually, there was a great church uh, Latin professor in Rome, a chap called Reggie Foster. Father Reggie was fond of saying that Latin can't be that difficult. Every prostitute in ancient Rome spoke it. <laughs> um, but I have to say, I found it rather more difficult. Than that. Um, but you know, they're, they're they're a great bunch. They're a great bunch, and uh, 
they work terribly hard and they're much more diligent than uh, than European students. Uh, right. I haven't yet had to chase them for their assignments. Yet, yet. We'll see how they go. Uh, well, they apologize. <laughs> they apologize even if they're early with their assignments. <laughs> so uh, that was not my experience in in Europe. Well, I'm, I'm interested to see how they progress and. Welcome to Macau. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you, and thank you again for being on the show. Not at all. Thanks very much. We'll be back again next week with more TDM Talk Show. Thank you for joining us. Good evening.